In today's episode of EU4, I'll play as Oirat, which is Horde, and in 100 years I'll try to recreate the Mongol Empire. It will require me to conquer territories from the Mongolian steppes through Central Asia to the territories of Eastern Europe, which I don't see yet. Oh, I forgot about Persia. So, a lot in a very short time. Just so you know, this screenshot isn't mine. No spoilers, I used a strategy known to more advanced players focusing on having a massive core creation cost reduction. But if you have any suggestions, let me know. Welcome in Imperialist, Lucas here. This screenshot isn't mine either. In this challenge, the new Oirat mission tree helped me a lot, consisting of three parts and being quite substantial. Also, my current ruler, Kanes and Choros, has decent stats to start with. But more importantly, he's an even better general. And isn't he quite young? Yes, in the previous version, he was much older, which changed a lot in my strategy. Before, we waited for our ruler to die and a decent successor to appear, then we abducted the Chinese emperor, ultimately leading to the fall of the empire. But that was then this is now, because the Tumu crisis now occurs from missions. Well, not entirely, but more on that later. I chose rivals that considered me their rival too. Yes, the Chagatai changed their name to Mogulistan, but nothing else changed except for missions. And Fars has a different color again. It was crucial for my strategy to form alliances with smaller hordes from Manchuria to prevent an early war with Ming. Usually, I aimed for a war with Ming when their mandate is very low. Currently, it's very high. Meaning Ming will soon undergo its first reform, the mandate of heaven will fall, and Ming will get those negatives. I made a national decision regarding tolerance of heretics and more prestige. I granted some standard tribal privileges and one new one that prevents the death of our successor if they're any good. Because hordes have this thing where the successor must be of age or else they have a strange accident upon our ruler's death. But I also sold land and asked my tribe for a mission. Oh, to regain manpower, who would have expected? Oh, I needed a lot. Oops. Nevertheless, I focused on administrative points at my court because I'll need a lot of them. Anyway, hordes always need them a lot, and I still hired a military advisor. I also started to focus on the loyalty of my vassal, Mongolia, by developing its provinces. I didn't form royal marriages with my allies, because those alliances are temporary. Instead, I formed a royal marriage with Mongolia, and I sent a diplomat to Ming to build a spy network. Although it will be a tough task. I don't accept the proposition to become a Ming tributary. At worst, when I notice their army at my border, I'll declare war on them myself. In mid 47s, Ming conducted its first reform, resulting in their army and the whole country having those negatives. They probably chose one of the worst reforms available to China. Why choose that? I resumed paying my army and activated defensive edicts in my fortress, which I have only one in the entire country. Then, with the appropriate Casas Belli, I attacked Ming. Not this one, not this one. Oh, this one. Mandate of Heaven. We conquer much more for half the cost. We don't call allies, we won't need them anyway. Ming has only four times the numerical advantage. I ordered Mongolian army to stay away and defend my territory. I also recruited a free mercenary company to my main army. It was crucial for me to find Ming's proper army, commanded by the emperor himself. Unfortunately, it's led by the heir to the throne. Oh, and here's my heir to the throne. Meanwhile, the emperor commands the largest Chinese army. Nevertheless, I proceeded to eliminate those smaller armies first. As a precaution, I haven't broken the alliance with Manchurian horde yet because it was quite possible that my western neighbors would attack me from behind. A bit deterrent action, boom boom, and I managed to intercept the emperor's army, which allowed me to capture him. In a surprising turn of events, we discovered that the Ming emperor was personally leading his army into battle. He was a fool to face us on the battlefield. We made short work of his pathetic, undisciplined soldiers, and even managed to capture the emperor himself. This allowed my armies to march straight to the capital. Yes, Beijing. I also completed the first mission related to the Tumu crisis in which we could decide the fate of the Chinese region. With the capture of the Ming region in the Tumu crisis and the panic that is happening in Beijing, new opportunities have arisen as to how we can approach the situation in China. The region has shown to be rather friendly even for a captive of ours. This may serve as a great opportunity we can exploit further and I think I clicked on this event at the wrong time because it changes this modifier for us. Oops. 
I decided not to use this mission yet. I still prefer to quickly conquer fortresses. At this point, Chinese armies were really few. Beijing fell after a two-year siege. And thanks to that, the entire northern part of China came under my rule. At least temporarily. Because Bot likes to quickly retake these territories. Now it was crucial for me to maintain the occupation of these territories and capture a few more fortresses. It was also a good time to break alliances with Manchurian hordes. Unfortunately, Korea quickly stopped being a Ming tributary. <coughs> And it was supposed to be my next target. Before ending the war with Ming, I had to position myself properly near its fortresses. Making sure my troops were either on my territory, or on the territory I would soon conquer. Then, I deactivated the garrisons of all fortresses I didn't plan to capture in this war. I also made sure to have two free diplomats by October 1st. It's super important. Oh, and the pause is important. I took the maximum number of provinces from China, including the capital. It will be transferred from Beijing here. And as much money as possible. It's super important. No war reparations. Now I can introduce feudal institutions, catch up on technology, plunder points and gold from all conquered provinces. And I'm still doing it on pause, I don't have loans to repay, but my inflation is enormous. However, at this point I can afford to hire level 1 advisors, and then I attacked Ming's tributary Karadel in this case. I'd prefer Korchin, but here I have 3 more years of peace, Ming will defend its tributary, and best of all, they currently have empty fortresses that we can practically occupy immediately by sending troops there. My armies had a month to reach those empty fortresses, and I'll take them in a moment, because there's no one to defend them. And Ming is almost ready to surrender. We just need to capture the capital. And after a moment, Ming gives me another 2800 ducats. And thanks to that, I'll finance all my future wars for the next 30 years. I'm not taking war reparations because China is on the verge of collapse. And what's even better, we have a shorter period of peace with them now. Over time, I also understood how this mission works exactly. Because yes, as usual, I misunderstood it before, it added those modifiers, not replaced them, so those bonuses turned out to be quite sensible in the end, and I should execute this mission just before the end of my first war with Ming. Tough luck. Next time, I'll remember. Definitely. Then I added all newly conquered territories to the trade companies, it realistically reduced unrest in provinces and provided me with greater religious unity. I also managed to get oaths of fealty from tribes. The most important thing in the war with Karadel, apart from money from Ming, was to capture those territories from Camus. It opened the way to the second stage of my plan. Because the first stage was the money from Ming, which I forgot to mention, I've calculated everything perfectly, as befits a pro gamer. After the war with Karadel, I designated Ming as my new rival. I also completed a mission that allowed me to decide my approach towards other religions. I had three options. Religious tolerance, intolerance, and Confucianism. The first path naturally made me more tolerant towards heretics. Usually, this is a good path for the hordes because they conquer so quickly that they don't have time to convert to a particular religion. The second path was odd. It allowed effective looting of provinces, with the conversion bonus essentially lasting for the ruler's lifetime. I found it weak. The Confucianism path intrigued me as it offered faster adoption of other religions and provided a mandate of heaven bonus. However, I intend to dismantle the mandate of heaven. I postponed the decision to consider it further. I hired a cheaper advisor from this mission and began the process of integrating Mongolia, which will take some time. Smaller states began emerging from China, but I wasn't interested in them at the moment. My priority was to quickly conquer the territories of the Manchu hordes to fulfill the mission as soon as possible. Each conquest increased the loyalty of my tribe when plundering a province, making cavalry cheaper. Very cool. I raided the first and second Manchu tribes and started reducing inflation, which was currently enormous. That's what happens when you print money from Ming. Recruited the second free company. Not sure where it came from. Now I have a mercenary army to suppress rebellions. I plan to introduce the Renaissance institution in the capital, although it's not the ideal location. I also made a decision regarding the religious mission, opting for tolerance. Ming was currently at war with all its neighbors, oddly benefiting from it to avoid collapse. Conquering Manchuria would increase my tribe's loyal. Despite currently raiding Manchuria, I decided to lay off this region for a while. Now I'm focusing on Korea and Shun, which was a prime target due to its lack of an army. I reformed my Kanate to recruit more army volunteers. Managed to introduce the Renaissance institution in Kobdo. After Shun's fall, the gateway to China was open. After many attempts at storming and capturing the Great Wall of China, we have finally succeeded in this operation. 
The One's Great Wall meant to keep nomads like us out of China is in our hands, granting us the ability to raid into China proper. Now it's time for more conquests. I must admit, implementing the last development, attrition for enemies plus two in Horde territories, would hurt all my opponents. From Korea, I conquered all its cheapest provinces, needing 15 for the mission, ensuring cheaper technology for the rest of the game, joyfully plundered the region too. Then I launched another war against Ming, as despite being smaller, it could still fill my coffers. Initially, I chose diplomatic ideas to expand further. For beginner players, I recommend starting with humanistic and offensive ideas for stability. My horde became gigantic, causing panic in Ming. Now it was all over for China. The second war with Ming ended with its humiliation, taking some provinces and money. No major resistance. After the recent wars, I could establish the nobility in my Kanate. Literally, granted privileges to the nobility. Now it's time for the second stage. Sent my diplomats to India to build spy networks, speeding up fortress captures. Bengal and Jaunpur first. Unfortunately, Mogulistan stole the gold mine I planned to take. In 1470, my armies were ready to enter India, just waiting to annex the last provinces and seize land. I'll wait a bit, some fortresses I decided to storm as conquering them took too long. At this point, my armies are truly numerous. India doesn't seem ready for a horde invasion, one without major issues. Chose the first idea from the era, opting for less aggressive expansion. Within a short time, my enemy's army ceased to exist completely, let Jampur's allies pay me tribute, I captured as many forts as possible during the war, and I constructed routes to further targets. Ahead of schedule, I also advanced to the seventh military technology. Cannons were crucial, now the main goal is to conquer as many provinces as possible, and develop Hinduism. Unluckily, my Khan died very quickly. <coughs> Did I really make a typo there? <clears throat> anyway, Boajé Khan rules the world's largest empire. My next war target was Orissa, which grants access to Andhra and ultimately Vijayanagar, before moving on to Bahmanis. By the way, an opportunity arose to reset my peace terms with Jampur because they're guaranteeing independence to that country. With cannons, I could bombard fortresses more frequently, already advanced in technology by 16 years. I kept adding these territories to trading companies. That's all I did. And then the rebellions erupted. I also granted privileges to the tribal lands. I started running out of governance. A coalition could have formed against me, but I didn't worry too much about it. I also initiated the Golden Age. It reduced the costs of annexing provinces and lowered technology expenses. As a result, I could take another idea ahead of schedule. Administrative. I was eager to reach the third level as quickly as possible. After the war with Orissa, I immediately launched further attacks. Unfortunately, Andhra was allied with Vijayanagar. I had to make a white peace with the Yellow Canary as soon as possible. In the meantime, I slowly developed the Hindu province to complete this mission. In the Indian wars, technological superiority played its part. Meanwhile, Mongolia finally became an integral part of my country. This gave me a significant name size. The size of the name is crucial in this game. I make all Mongolian territories states, although this caused some issues. Fortunately, I could still develop in other ways. From then on, I also stopped adding newly conquered areas to trading companies. After a while, I could also undertake missions to unite the tribe and the whole of Mongolia. Since the fall of the Great Mongol Empire, there have been many attempts to reunite the Mongol people. None have succeeded for more than a brief moment. Like many before us, we have a assembled a horde with warriors and chieftains from every tribe, but this unity will likely be temporary. Alright, I managed to pull it off. Personally, I preferred having more acceptable culture. I began to have increasing problems with religious unity. Confucianism had the largest religious presence, so I chose Confucianism as the accepted religion, but ultimately it didn't help me much. <coughs> then I engaged in another war with Jampur. My horde also became more tolerant, and it will be even more tolerant depending on the level of this advisor. Next, I had to invade Bahmanis and Bengal. My plans for Bengal were to strip away some of its alliances. I wondered how elephant armies could lose to cavalry. For some reason, in my mind, those battles always looked something like this. Unfortunately, Bahmanis was another empire with a lot of forts to capture. I also managed to unify the faith by implementing another religious reform. This resulted in a new state for me. Shamanism. Give me that governing. I also acquired a monument, which is crucial for my tactics. It not only reduces my aggressive expansion, but also lowers the cost of annexing new provinces by an additional 10%. I just need to change religion. Especially since at this point, I've already developed administrative ideas to the third level, making province annexation 45% cheaper. I took literally all the forts from Bahmanis, all of them, and now I get more administrative points from looting provinces than I lose from annexing them. After a while, I could conquer more, which is convenient because ahead of me is a war with Vijayanagar. However, 
Vijayanagar's troops were a bit more significant. Conquering forts in India made me approach them more cautiously and divide my army into smaller units. The tribes also tasked me with plundering the entire Malwa region, which I gladly did. This will now allow me to effectively reform my governance, and at this point it occurred to me that it would be worth having some tributaries. Vijayanagar also handed over all its forts to me. And after these conquests, my Kanate became an empire. Another mission I could undertake reinforced battlefield events. They are supposed to happen more frequently. So far, I haven't had a single one. During this battlefield event, I'll have a chance for a better general. And after a while, I got that general. And he was really good. Now I read that to complete this mission, I had to win 50 battles. And currently, I have 133. After the conquest of Vijayanagar, Hinduism became the dominant religion, which allows me to accept rebel demands and convert. Hinduism itself is a very tolerant religion, which will be useful to me. But more importantly, I can now choose a bonus that further reduces the costs of annexing new provinces by 10%. To further increase tolerance in my country, I had to build more churches. But more importantly, I started building a monument. Even the first level gives me something. Changing religion initiates the third phase, in which I will now conquer the entire region of China. This should significantly improve the horde's economy. Adding new provinces was now really cheap. I started wars with all the smaller kingdoms in China. Although, I won't hide the fact that a coalition formed against me was a problem. Chinese armies were still much weaker than Mongolian ones. During the conquest of China, Han Boazi becomes a legendary conqueror. That's a really good trait. I had a large surplus of governance, so I decided to expand my trading areas in India. I now take over all provinces with trade centers from countries in addition to forts. This will help me dominate trade in the area and finally generate some significant profits. The coalition against me is finally starting to dissolve. After converting gold provinces to the right faith, I lowered autonomy and upgraded them to level 10, yielding almost 7 additional ducats. I was technologically advanced after conquering Ming. Oirat's earnings doubled within 5 years. I had to wage war against Dai Viet because they conquered part of China, which I needed for a mission. Stability in hordes is always useful. My armies remained formidable. After stealing maps, I improved relations with all discovered countries. Despite it being 1502, there's still no news of colonialism. I mean, I still didn't know what colonialism was. I swiftly conquered China, so now I'm directing my horde towards India and later Persia. This shift comes at a good time, as periods of peace are ending abruptly. I was earning enough to start building the second level of the monument and plan to speed up construction. At this stage of the campaign, most wars felt repetitive. I attack the main target and immediately seek a separate peace with my enemy's ally to shorten the peace period with the main target. Just like I'm doing with Sibe and Ming now. Although conquering India isn't necessary for forming the Mongol Empire, it significantly boosts my trade income and manpower reserves. Plus, it's one of the easiest regions to conquer in the game. And enemy armies, they are usually easy to defeat. Really easy. News of colonialism reached my horde. I remembered I was in a second war, because I wanted to develop the capital. Luckily, I quickly made peace. I'll introduce colonialism in a province near my capital to spread it faster. The point cost doesn't matter much. Provinces are joining my empire rapidly. So fast, I can't keep up with conquests. I felt quite rusty. To hasten conquests, I raised smaller armies. I swiftly implemented colonialism and chose new ideas, opting for humanist ones to stabilize my country. Then I joyfully invaded Delhi and Sindh since they're nearby. Has Fars changed color again? I moved north to claim all of India. Despite it being nearly 1510, there were no signs of the Reformation era approaching, which could pose a challenge to make it in time. I wondered if I could check Catholic discontent somehow, but it seems unlikely. Meanwhile, I received an extra 15% aggressive expansion, definitely useful. Maybe it'll make a difference in the future. I surpassed 2000 development in 1510 and secured India. I also remembered a monument essential to me, I had to build it. In 1511, I brought down the Great Ming Dynasty concluding Phase 3, a prerequisite for creating UN, which marks Phase 4. Destroying Ming is the only way to rid myself of the Mandate of Heaven requirement for establishing UN. The Mandate of Heaven doesn't fare well with hordes. Has anyone tried dealing with it? At this point, I've conquered nearly both rich regions. I could complete the mission to adopt the Dragon Throne, making my horde even more stable. Fewer rebellions are always good news. But wait, that's just before the next era. <coughs> With the earned and looted money, I started constructing the final level of the monument. 
Burning that development stung, especially since I had hundreds of provinces, but only recovered a hundred points. Finally, I reached the moment to delve into Central Asia, particularly Persia. It's a bit late, but there's no rush as the reformation hasn't occurred yet, although it seemed I had to hasten even more. I also managed to establish a religious freedom, enabling me to grant another privilege to increase tolerance. But does it scale? Unfortunately, Boise Han perished and in his place. How old was he anyway? His reign spans a history of successes, but his age, regardless, I now have a very tolerant country. After conquering Central Asia, I could determine the future of the Kazakh people. So, for now, maybe I'll hold back on annexing new provinces. Frankly, I feel like releasing them as my vassal. A hundred administrative points seem weak, and here, the Kazakhs become an incorporated vassal. Then, we'll gain firm control over all their territories, and I can integrate them for free. I tested it earlier on console. Meanwhile, I briefly created Yuan, only to find most of its missions are identical to Oirat's, except for the middle part. Yuan's ideas are much stronger than Oirat's. I reverted to plain Oirat. I also initiated the construction of a significant moment to bolster my economy, but only to the second level. It'll greatly impact my human resources as well. I also encountered the Muscovites, who immediately declared me a rival. It's huge. Finally, in 10 years, the Reformation era will arrive. Quite late, I have conquered all of Khorostan, a perfect prelude to Persia. Then I started dismantling all forts in the Indian region because they were draining my finances. Currently, my country is so stable that rebellions hardly pose a threat. Well, there are still some, but not significant ones. It's time to attack the fallen Timur Empire, which is crucial for me. The war was swift and I conquered a lot. I also attacked the country guaranteed by Timur to shorten the peace period. I really got tired of burning those provinces, but it had to be done. After Timur's fall, I could execute the mission, granting claims to all of Khorostan, which I had already conquered. I might have approached this mission from the backwards. Next, I attacked Ajam, but unfortunately, they were allied with Mamluks, whose capital was still in Cairo, quite far. Yes, I had more forts to breach. My opponent seemed somewhat indecisive in these battles. I also realized that dismantling all forts wasn't such a good idea. Since I was facing significant governing issues, I moved my capital to a province with an unpronounceable name. It's still the same state, just for consolidating development there. This raised the level to 41, reducing it here by only 50 points. <laughs> I really didn't feel like clicking through all that. However, achieving the mission to increase my maximum absolutism and gain a cool Han seems rather impossible for me, as I need 65% crown land, which I hadn't noticed. Surprising, isn't it? With continuous conquests, I can hardly surpass 30%. So ultimately, I'll form Yuan. Just in a moment, because moving the capital to Beijing will cause all my trade companies to disappear. I also continued with my Persian conquests, leaving the mission related to the fall of Hindustan for less. There's faster coring here. And ultimately, I've already formed Yuan. All trade companies disappeared from my territories. All of them. Which is actually good for governing, and I can easily restore them. I'll add areas with trade bonuses to trade companies. Only them, but in 5 years. After forming Yuan, I have a core creation cost minus 70%, and soon I'll get the last 5% I need from the 5th level of governmental reform. I could also embark on the path of developing my governance system, which would give me various bonuses from Chinese territories, reducing advisor costs and speeding up the spread of institutions. I also got a very good commander. Nice. There was also a path related to militarizing the area of China, but unfortunately it will take me some time because I need to build a lot of buildings. You might not believe it, but so far I've only built one barracks. You know, hordes don't build many buildings. I also noticed something went wrong with the Kazakhs. All Oirat's firm cores disappeared and Yuan's cores didn't replace them. Unfortunately, I'll have to annex this vassal conventionally. And unfortunately, it was quite costly. The absence of trade companies in China is causing me some temporary economic issues. My golden era has also come to an end. Finally, I've entered the era of reformation. Luckily, my splendor is increasing rapidly, so I won't have to wait long for the religious war. I've started establishing strong trade companies in both India and the Persian region. This involves adding entire areas with trade bonuses to the trade company, saving me a lot of governing points and ensuring additional merchants. Remember, any other area not in a trade company will receive a goods production bonus. It's hard to believe, but I'm actually building a Mongol fleet now. Because until now, I didn't have a single ship. 
I've also initiated my first invasion of Moscow which has been my strongest opponent so far. After a moment, troops of the Muscovites appeared. Utilizing the flat terrain in Moscow's capital to defeat their armies is just beautiful, despite facing a formidable general. Those losses, nice. However, Moscow's power ultimately couldn't alter its fate, as I conquered a great deal. I've also warned Russia against attacking our shared neighbors, as I've received information about their planned assault on Uzbek. At the moment, I'm juggling many conquests simultaneously. I was finishing my conquest in Persia and preparing for conquests in the Eastern European region. As I conclude my wars, I'm awaiting the introduction of the religious war. This mission allowed me to focus on the military development of UN, although I still have a mission ahead that requires increasing the number of cavalry in my army, and I want that bonus. Using the spoils of war, I expanded my regiment camps. While they don't offer much at the moment, perhaps in the future, China will be my state. However, a better use of these funds would have been to enhance trade companies. Speaking of which, I could now begin adding those provinces back to them. Setting this up took about 15 minutes, but provided me with 5 additional merchants. I also preferred to maintain an open trade policy in China. The Russian Empire has also emerged, but I doubt it will last long as the Ottoman Empire has just attacked Russia. Russia seems aggressive. Finally, I could enact the fifth reform, albeit a bit late, despite feeling war fatigued. It doesn't bother me, because I'm getting closer to my goal. Finally, this allowed me to end wars by conquering literally all my adversaries. After burning provinces, I could afford to lower war exhaustion. I conquered everything at once. I didn't even worry about overextension because, frankly, at this point, all provinces will be assimilated within about 8 months. This means any potential revolts won't really materialize unless they were already high. So, to expedite the conquest process even further, I used that mission for 15 years. This enables me to annex all provinces in less than 6 months. Oh, I can have banners as UN, I forgot about that. But I still won't use them. The only major downside of this overextension for me is that it significantly reduces my trade income. Look at how everything has transformed. In a moment, it's down to just 50%. It's such a powerful strategy. I can't believe it. But for the first time as a horde, I've utilized a fleet. I increased my army stacks to 886, though I could have had a bit more cavalry. Thanks to my missions, it was becoming even stronger. I also further boosted the power of my army. Soon I'll be at war with the Ottoman Empire. The Turks simply had the Anatolian steppes. Fortunately, they were far behind me in terms of development. Now I can declare a festival every 10 years, which comes with some nice bonuses. Ajam disappeared. Hormuz disappeared. Almost. As I already had a lot of aggressive expansion with the Ottoman Empire, I had to declare war on them. Although earlier I had the opportunity to decide whether I wanted to open Ikanat. Not really. Now that I've raised the entire Persian region, it's time to change my main trade center. I just need to finish the war. Before transferring trade, I earn 90 gold. And now, only 122? Somewhere? There's a leak, but really, is France an ally of the Ottoman Empire? Well, this will be interesting. The war with the Ottoman Empire was in full swing. For now, I've conquered the province of Egyptian Eliyat, which strengthens my trade in Basra. It was my first gap in uh, trade. Unfortunately, Gujarat is the second. Here, I had to build a trade fleet. I built a lot of fleet. The first battle with the Ottoman armies occurred, but they will probably be defeated. At least, that's what it seems like to me. Literally, French troops also appeared. The French armies had very good statistics, but I must admit a hopeless composition allowing my cavalry to massacre their artillery. Don't organize armies like France. From the Ottoman Empire, I only took the most necessary provinces, the Anatolian steppes. Now I've attacked Poland because time is running out. Here I'll even start storming the fortress. I also had to break the peace with Russia because they started occupying provinces I needed. I'm fighting three wars simultaneously for the last three provinces. From Poland, I'm taking what I need. The entire Anatolian steppes are mine. Two years too late, or more accurately, 1.5 years, I can finally create the Mongol Empire, which I'm doing now. It was easier than I thought. I conquered a bit too much in India, and yes, I conquered too slowly. I was completely rusty, and I didn't even know I didn't have to core those provinces. I would have just conquered everything again on Broken Truce. Now, I had a moment to improve my borders or buildings for trade companies, mainly starting with production. Many wars at once, 125% overextension and literally no revolts. Very strange, but the printing press appeared in Kobdo. No, actually here, but it's also in Kobdo. And after a few years, the Mongol Empire has improved 
its borders. Mighty income, mighty army, and a path of conquests to follow. But that's up to you. Let me know if you want a second episode. After all, Europe or Africa could be my next conquest targets. In this episode, you can see how powerful the new Venice is as a trading republic. 